From the Bishop School in La Jolla, California, I'm Fred Child, and welcome to NPR at La Jolla Music Society's Summerfest. Five string players are on stage with me to play music by Mozart. <laughs> Just the opening moments of music by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Eine kleine Nachtmusik, played by violist Paul Neubauer, violinists Trisha Park and Yuri Namkung, cellist Amir Eldan, and bass player Da Shun Zhang. Sometimes you hear a full orchestra playing this piece, but actually Mozart originally wrote this for only five players. And we'll hear this quintet play the full opening movement in a moment. But first, here to tell us more about this piece and what makes it so great is pianist, composer, and our what makes it so great answer man and commentator Rob Capolo. Hi, Rob. Hi, Fred. That those opening moments of, of the piece that this quintet just played for us are, in a way, so pedantic, so so simple, in a sense, but at the same time, it's so memorable. What's going on in the Well, in you know, it's opening? interesting. One of the things that's so striking to me about Mozart is the breathtaking pace of invention. Even that opening idea, you know, it starts with a single note. A moment later, you've already added a lower note. Put three of them together, and we've almost got Mozart. That would be pedantic. But there's one surprise. Surprise! And that's what makes it memorable. Even so, I mean, it almost sounds like just a, a bugle call there, there at the beginning. What, what, where does it go after that? Well, funny you should ask. You know, this piece is so fantastic because if you listen to it casually, it just sounds like wonderful, bubbly, energetic, bright background music. But if you pay close attention, it's staggering how much is going on. I'm going to spend which will seem like the rest of your life on the next four <laughs> seconds of music. But these four seconds are an example of what's actually in Ina Klein and Nacht music. And we're going to start with the melody. And I thought to really get you inside this piece, I would build it up for you from ordinary to great, from a version that, say, Salieri might have written to something that Mozart actually wrote. So here's my horrible version. This is really not Salieri, it's me. And my version starts with a really annoying bum bum at the beginning of every measure. Bum bum. Bum bum. Bum bum. Intolerable, that's my version. Now, I decided to make it slightly better. And instead of copying my first bum bum with another bum bum, I added a little note above it, a kind of tiny leaning note which we call an appoggiatura. Now, when you hear the first bum bum followed by appoggiatura, you're gonna say on the audience, I love it. What could be better? I'm so relieved she's at least not doing bum bum a second time. But you will discover to your vast horror that appoggiatura becomes as annoying as bum bum. Listen to this version. Bum bum, first appoggiatura. Lovely, ah. Second, annoying. Third one, intolerable. So what are you supposed to do? We started off with bum bum, which I copied as bum bum. I made it a little better as an appoggiatura like this. But if you alternate those two notes quickly, you can turn it into a fantastic trill. Oh, great discovery. Now, once again, though, the first one is going to sound great. Trill becomes even more annoying than appoggiatura, which was even more annoying than bum bum, like this. Bum bum. Trill. First one's great. Second one, ridiculous. Third one, impossible. So what does Mozart do? Here's your quiz question at home. Here's Mozart's version. Your three possibilities are bum bum, appoggiatura, and trill. Listen to what he does a surprise every minute. So 
so what you heard was bum bum, then aha, trill, and then an appoggiatura, which is a not trill, and then a trill. So at every moment, something new is happening. However, if you were just listening casually on a warm summer evening, you would just think it's just a melody. And the, all of that is happening in just the melody, just the first violin part in those opening moments. Rob, please tell me the accompaniment is simple at least. No such luck, Fred. <laughs> the accompaniment is just as complicated and it's wonderful. And what's best about it is that it's wonderful for viola. Now, you know that violas have a reputation for playing these boring parts, and we happen to have one of the world's most famous viola players with us here today. So I have written a really boring part that Mozart could have written for the viola like this. Can look bored. He's looking more and more bored. <laughs> However, Mozart's version has two wonderful surprises right in the middle, like this. Here, and another one. Now, here's the payoff. This is unbelievable. Now, those five notes would have been great by themselves, just as wonderful surprises. But the moment he plays that, the violin plays the same thing right after. The two of them make a lovely little round. See if you can hear both of them happening at the same time. Here. And not only that, while all the other accompaniment instruments are playing at a medium pace, bum, 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 one instrument is playing twice as fast. So the whole texture sparkles. Now we're going to put the whole thing together. You're going to hear bum, bum, trill, appoggiatura, trill in the melody, fantastic viola playing a little round with the first violin, and a fantastic second violin part going da 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 and this is the first 10 seconds of a little serenade. Second part, trill, appoggiatura, round between the two parts here. Now, how many of you heard all that? That's why God invented rewind. <laughs> <laughs> that's remarkable. Now, that's just the first 10 seconds of that piece. And that helps me understand why what sounds so pedantic is, in fact, so memorable. All those you know, little turns and extra elements that Mozart throws in. You know, Mozart himself, in an amazing passage, described his own music to his father. And he said, quote, there are passages here and there from which connoisseurs alone can derive satisfaction. But these passages are written in such a way that the less learned cannot fail to be pleased, though without knowing why. Now you know why. And here is the first movement of Eine Kleine Nacht music.
That's music by Mozart. You might hear it sometimes with full orchestra. That's how Mozart originally wrote the piece, though, for just five string players, two violins, viola, cello, and double bass, played for us here at Summerfest in La Jolla, California, by Trisha Park and Yuri Namkong playing violins, violist Paul Neubauer, who uh, Rob almost described as one of the world's great players of boring parts, uh, Rob <laughs> Neubauer playing, and all others. playing viola, cellist Amir Eldan, and bass player Da Shun Shong, and explaining it all for us are what makes makes it so great commentator, Rob Capolo. Rob, thank you very much. My pleasure. And how about one more round of applause? Some music is written to be played in grand spaces. It's monumental music. It seeks to express our deepest passions and emotions. Some music, on the other hand, is written for more humble places and for more simple pleasures. We're about to hear a rather unusual piece by Antonin Dvorak. It's called Terzetto, and it's written for a rather unusual trio, two violins and one viola. And here at La Jolla Music Society Summerfest to play it for us, the Summerfest artistic director and violinist, Cho Liang Lin, Jimmy Lin, the Dallas Symphony concertmaster, violinist Emmanuel Borok, and violist Paul Neubauer. Uh, Rob, this is an unusual combination, two violins and, and viola. I understand Dvorak wrote this for a group of friends to play, is that right? Yeah, actually he wrote this for a student of his who he thought would play the second violin part, but then it's kind of interesting, the piece ended up being way too difficult, and so he had to write another piece for him, and the, and the student actually never got to play it. But it's sort of interesting because you end up writing what you write. Even though you may have had the best intentions at the beginning, you end up writing what you write. You're trying to write it simply for your student, but... That's right, but it just <laughs> the, didn't work out The musical out that ideas way. take you where they go. Well. And he wrote that for, for a student, but for himself to play, too. He, yes. He, in fact, many people don't know that Dvorak himself was a professional violist and spent many, many years before he became a famous composer actually playing in orchestra. So, in fact, today, Paul Neubauer is Dvorak. <laughs> well, well let's, let's ask him about that. Paul Neubauer, can you tell anything about Dvorak as a violist from the way he wrote the part? Well, it's, it's pretty hard because we don't have any schnapps or Slivovitz here, but... <laughs> Which probably would have been part of those concerts with yes. friends. Well, he apparently enjoyed. Uh, he enjoyed That's the life. not-for-profit radio. Yeah, part. He, he enjoyed life to the fullest. <laughs> but uh, in any case, I think it's sort of interesting that the viola is the cello and the viola at the same time. So you're covering both bases, and also the second violin takes over the some of the inner stuff as well. So we're sort of both second violin and the viola have this inner line, but. Someone has to play the bass. There always has to be this filling of the bass line, so that's up to me to, or usually me. Sometimes you'll, uh, the second violin will have that. But you'll notice that this piece is just like, where is the cello? <laughs> and, but it still works, and that's the interesting thing about it. There are so few pieces written for this combination. It's a great serenade of Kodai, and as he said, this terzetto, and the romantic pieces also for this combination. But so few others, maybe uh, a couple, yeah, a couple other pieces, but usually they write for the cello also. So I am Mr. Cello, according to Mr. Dvorak. And we ha what we have here is 75 percent of a string quartet. The, the cello is missing, and, and when you said you're you're covering all the bases, I mean that's. Uh, a play on words, B-A-S-E-S -S -E and B-A-S-S-E-S. -S -S. You're, you're covering exactly. the bases. That's exactly what I meant, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why he gets paid <laughs> double. No. But the interesting thing is, though, in spite of the fact that Paul says he's always thinking, where is the cello? What makes the piece so wonderful is that only Paul is thinking, where is the cello? The piece is written so beautifully, and Paul plays the part so elegantly that actually the audience is rarely ever thinking, where is the cello? Now, Rob, what are the simple pleasures of this terzetto? 
Yeah, I think the first thing you have to imagine is it's Sunday afternoon. Nowadays, if you go to someone's house for Sunday afternoon brunch, you may bring along wine, you may go for the eating, but imagine a world in which you came over for Sunday brunch, but you brought your instruments. And the actual idea was not just to eat, but to play together. So imagine three players playing, and the real audience for this piece, though we have a lovely audience out here at Summerfest and we're in a lovely hall, the real audience for this piece is actually the other players. So at the heart of this piece is the feeling of, here's a lovely moment, and you smile over at the viola who plays an elegant little line. You smile over at the second violin, you play something together. It's really an intimate conversation among friends, which is why it's going to be so hard to do today. Um, but no, I, I was only kidding, only kidding. So the kinds of small pleasures, let's hear. Here's the opening phrase and then we'll just look. What are the things that make you glance at each other and smile? Well, the opening idea for the first violin is just four notes, which could easily have been copied by viola like this. If he had copied it exactly, the three parts together would have sounded like this. But Dvorak changes one note. Instead of this in the viola, it's this, and that makes the chord move forward momentum and they smile at each other. And from there, we're following small pleasures everywhere. The second violin plays two notes. A lovely chord, ah, a moment in church. Then a lovely viola line for the bass, as Dvorak says, I'm so glad I wrote this for myself. Then not this, but this lovely Dvorak chord, ah. And that kind of ah is what the piece is all about. And then when you come back to the opening idea, instead of this version, it's stretched out. The first note is longer to become this. And when they all play, it pushes the second half of the phrase forward like this. And listen to the lovely viola. Ah, ah is what this piece is all about. Now, Rob, that's the, the opening idea, that opening theme. Development is where a, a bigger piece, a more monumental piece, would bring in emotional counterpoint and, and musical counterpoint and really develop a, a different kind of a deeper emotional idea. What happens in the, in the development of the idea of this piece? Yeah, unlike a Beethoven piece where you're literally plumbing the profound depths of the universe, looking deep within these themes to find what are they fundamentally meaning at the core, here what they are is just lovely new possibilities in combination. So this opening idea simply gets moved down to become this, and then lower like this, and then you'll find we come back to the opening after some lovely new combinations and that feeling of returning home is what it's all about. Do it lower, and lower. Push forward a little. And then an idea, fast trade-off, viola, second violin, all of them together, furioso. We gradually wind our way back, heading for home, and we're back, and they all smile. Home is what it's all about. We repeat the whole opening, second half, and change it to make an ending, and the viola, Ah. Now we're, we're heading for the end of the first movement here, but the first movement doesn't really end. I mean, D Dvorak, even though he's writing this for three friends to be played at home, this is the same guy who wrote some massive symphonies. The seventh and eighth and ninth symphonies have huge moments, and Dvorak is still Dvorak, e even in this piece written for home. Right, whoever said composers are not schizophrenic. All of a sudden, we leave the world of the intimate living room, and suddenly we're not only in a concert hall, we're in Beethoven's concert hall. And what we're about to do is make this transition. The piece basically comes to a close, but then the idea is we're going to sing our song of the second movement in a profoundly new place. But in order to sing that song in this new place, we have to journey there, and it has to be difficult to get there. So we travel here, we travel there, and we seem to go absolutely everywhere over the globe until we discover East 
Timor, which is where we speak from the heart. So here's the ending and the journey to East Timor, which is where the second movement begins. A simple ending. And it should end with these three chords. And we should be done. All of a sudden, we're in Beethoven's concert hall. <gasps> a surprise chord. Where are we? We're journeying. Maybe it's here. We're trying to find our place. And all of a sudden, we're in this miraculous region, and we sing this beautiful song, like the New World Symphony. And that's what makes this piece so lovely. Well, let's hear it. Let's hear this terzetto by Anthony Dvorak, played by two violinists. They are Cholyang Lin and Emmanuel Borok, and violist Paul Neubauer. We're at Summerfest in La Jolla.
Music by Antony Dvorak, written for three friends to play together at home. Our three friends at home on stage at the Bishop School in La Jolla, California, violinist Emmanuel Borak, violinist Chul Young Lin, violist Paul Neubauer, in the role of Dvorak, who uh, played the viola himself and wrote that viola part for himself. Music that, for the most part, is music of simple pleasures, music of clear, beautiful, sunny blue sky. There might have been one passing thunderstorm, but I didn't even feel a drop. And then all it did was make the, the sunset all the more beautiful at the end of the piece. And uh, the man who introduced that music to us and that performance to us, our, uh, our answer man, what makes it so great answer man, Rob Capolo. Rob, thank you very much. And part of what I love about you is your active mind. You're, you're, you're always thinking, and I'm just wondering if during the course of that piece, anything else came to mind that well, you, know, you wanted actually, to say about it. Actually, it did. Um, you know, one of the things that was wonderful is that it's great to have a superstar group like we have here on this beautiful stage in this beautiful hall with an audience listening to this music, playing it at such an incredibly high level. But it's lovely to remember that this music grew out of a world in which it wasn't on a stage, it wasn't in a hall, it wasn't superstars, it was a bunch of friends getting together, playing music that grew out of normal life. There's a wonderful quote that, I th that actually came to my mind, and it said, 200 years ago, we used to have great love for music, but little respect. Now we have great respect, but little love. This is music that grew out of a time when there was great love. And I heard great love in that performance. Thank you. Emmanuel Borak, Jimmy Lin, and Paul Neubauer, thank you very much. At La Jolla Music Society Summerfest, I'm Fred Child with a special guest joining us now, a violinist whose unique musical voice has been shaped by his experience with folk music, with jazz, and with classical music. As a youngster, he won every major folk fiddling competition in the country. He then moved to Nashville, played on something like 450 Nashville recordings. He but he's a musical omnivore, and his voracious musical appetite has taken him well into the classical world as well. His collaborators have included Isaac Stern, Yo-Yo Ma, the Chicago Symphony, Willie Nelson, Dolly Parton, Paul Simon, Wynton Marsalis, and many, many others. Would you please welcome Mark O'Connor. <laughs> Mark, thanks for being here. Oh, it's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you. Now, you're in your early 40s, but you're celebrating the 30th anniversary of your professional career as, <laughs> as a musician. Do you remember your first professional gig? Oh, yes. It was, uh, it was uh, a great experience. My, my uh, first album had just come out. I was 12 years old. And um, my mom said, now you better take your records with you, son, because they might want to sell them at your show. And so I remember... Uh, I didn't. I never collected money before, so I had money literally stuffed in be each of my pockets, my front pockets, my shirt pockets. It was so funny to if if someone had a uh, camera to uh, film me taking uh, people's money uh, for my r recordings when I was 12 years old. But that was the beginning of it. Now then, you moved to Nashville and and became kind of the go-to guy for for solo fiddle and, and Nashville recording sessions. How did you make that transition from being a young whippersnapper in Seattle to, to being the Nashville session guy? Well, my, uh, my initial attempt was, was fairly humble. I was just wanting to, to try to pick up a little bit of work so I could help pay my rent while I work on my own music. And uh, what happened was something that uh, was, I think, surprising to me and, and maybe a few others, that I became one of the most in-demand country music session people in Nashville almost overnight and so I was busy with that for a few years and I decided to retire from that at age 29 and, and go back to uh, my solo career. 
Now, your solo career has taken you into so many different musical worlds, and, and your background in folk music and jazz, you, you studied with Stefan Grappelli for a while and played with Stefan Grappelli for a while, and classical music, means that you've developed a technique on the violin that's really your own, and, and the technique that you really put together combining all these disciplines. How is what you do on the violin different from what most classical violinists might do? Well, it's over the, the years, it seems like I've uh, starting to started to assemble uh, a list of uh, stylistic um, directions and uh, techniques to follow the style uh, to accumulate into what I'm now calling maybe an American style string playing. Um, and uh, the, a lot of the music that I that I do and I, I compose, I draw from different um, sectors of the musical world and use it as musical bridges to come to uh, this kind of Americana melting pot style that, that I'm, I guess, known for now. Now, in your generation, there are not many people who do that kind of border crossing, but you're now not only a, a performer and composer, but a, a great teacher as well. Is, there, is the next generation of violinists and, and other performers on other instruments going to have more people who cross borders like this? What's well, interesting, about 10 years ago, I started uh, my music camps, and we actually hold one here in San Diego. It just concluded about a week or two ago. And uh, we, had, we were sold out with 220 students for the academy. Uh, then in combination with our Tennessee camp a month earlier with another 200 students. So I saw 400 students this summer. And all of these folks are really wanting to do this you know, multidisciplinary approach to string music. And it's, and it's just growing and growing uh, with each year that goes by. Now this multidisciplinary approach that you're describing informs the music that you write and that you write for yourself to play. And you have a little excerpt from your violin concerto number two to play for us. This was written for the 200th anniversary of the state of Tennessee. Actually 150 years. Uh, uh, the Tennessee State Committee uh, commissioned this piece and um, it was performed originally with the Nashville Symphony and um, I wrote the music about that beautiful state and the first movement has a lot to do with uh, the beautiful natural habitat of Tennessee and the subject of this piece uh, is its rolling hill environment and as well as the mockingbird that lives in that environment. So is there a mockingbird call that, that makes its way into the music that, that you can show us before you play this one? Yeah, you'll hear in this piece the mockingbird takes on several different uh, uh, characteristics. You'll hear things like <coughs> and um, the main, the call of the mockingbird that sings the melody. And that's uh, uh, then it's also s does some scurrying around, you know, like quick feet. So you'll hear all those kinds of things throughout this piece. All right, let's hear this excerpt from the piece called Fanfare for the Volunteer, the Violin Concerto Number no. Two by Mark O'Connor, written for the sesquicentennial of the state of Tennessee. And we'll hear uh, this excerpt called The Call of the Mockingbird. Thank <laughs> you. 
That is the most rambunctious and virtuosic mockingbird I've ever heard. <laughs> the call of the mockingbird from a piece called Fanfare for the Volunteer, the Violin Concerto Number no. 2, written by Mark O'Connor and played for us by Mark O'Connor, special guest here at the Bishop School at La Jolla Music Society's Summerfest. Mark O'Connor, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.